Shalom, my dear friends, I'm going to share my Kol Nidre sermon, and I'm sharing it here. It's not going to be given live because of the Corona virus and um, all the restrictions in the synagogue. Uh, what I ask of each and every one of you, please, is do not listen to this recording on Yom Kippur proper. It is forbidden. Please listen either pre-Yom Kippur or post-Yom Kippur. Okay, the title of this sermon is, What Vow Does God Nullify? Subtitle, Getting Beyond the Curtain of Sin. So, I want to start with sharing with you studies about the corona. You know, studies show that the corona quarantining has caused a lot of domestic discord between spouses. And yet, nevertheless, studies are predicting a baby boom because of corona quarantining. So to Kabbalists and to Hasidic studies, this dichotomy comes as no surprise, for this is the secret of darkness that from it comes the greatest light. And with this, we can now understand the light that Yom Kippur brings forth from the darkness of our sins. Introduction. Upon the verse in Exodus, chapter 21, verse 1, the verse says, And these are the ordinances. Our sages teach in the Medrash Rabbah, and I quote, This is what it is written in Psalms 147, 19. He tells his words to Jacob, his statutes, and his judgments to Israel. And our sages go on to explain, For the attributes of the Holy One, blessed be He, is not like the attributes of flesh and blood. The attributes of flesh and blood is that He commands others to do, and He Himself does not do. And the Holy One, blessed be He, is not so. Only that which He does, do, He tells Israel to do and to heed. And being that our sages teach us that a custom of the Jewish people is Torah, thus this concept that God does what we do applies also to the customs, including the custom that all Jews participate in, and that is the Kol Nidre services, the annulment of our vows, as a prelude to Yom Kippur. Thus, from all this, the question begs to be asked. So God is saying, Kol Nidre, he is annulling a vow. Which vow is it that God is annulling as a prelude to Yom Kippur? Additionally, in Hasidus it explains that God's performing the mitzvot works in two ways. A, God performs it first, and this empowers us to perform it. And B, we perform it first, and this causes God in response to perform it as well. So, how does this work with the Kol Nidre? What is the Kol Nidre that God is saying? How does that empower us to have our Kol Nidre and our Yom Kippur? So, in the Talmud, in the tractic on Yom Kippur, which is called Yuma, our, our sages teach concerning the greatness of Teshuvah. This is what they teach. Rosh Lakish, his real name was Rabbi Shimon. Rosh Lakish said, Great is repentance as the penitent's intentional sins are counted for him as unwitting transgressions. As it is stated in Hosea, Return Israel to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled in your iniquities. And the Talmud analyzes this verse. Doesn't iniquity mean an intentional sin? Yet the prophet Hosea calls it stumbling, implying that one who repents is considered as though he only stumbled accidentally in his transgression, even though he did it intentionally. That's the power of Tehillim, of Teshuvah. 
implying that one who repents is considered as though he only stumbled accidentally in his transgression. Okay, now the Gemara goes on and asks, is this so? Is this what Rosh Lakish said? One second, we have a different teaching from Rosh Lakish. Didn't Rosh Lakish himself say, great is repentance as one intentional sins are counted to him as merits, as mitzvot. As it is stated, and he quotes a verse from Ezekiel, and when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does that which is lawful and right, he shall live thereby. And all his deeds, even his transgressions, will become merits. So it's not just that our intentional sins through repentance becomes considered as a stumbled, unintentional, and thus forgiven, but even more so, they become as mitzvot, as good deeds. Intentional sins become good deeds through repentance. So which one is it? The Talmud asks. And therefore the, the Gemara reconciles this and says, no, it's not difficult. Here, when one repents out of love, the big sins become like mitzvot, merits. There, when one repents out of fear, the, sin is, the sins are counted as unwitted transgressions. So there you go. If you do teshuva out of love, not only are your iniquities considered as mistakes, unintentional and forgiven, but they're actually transformed into merits, into mitzvot, into good deeds. Now, in Kabbalah and Hasidus, they explain that the difference between teshuva out of love and teshuva out of fear is the difference between the teshuva of Yom Kippur and the teshuva of all year. Now, on the 10 days of Teshuvah from Rosh Hashanah until Yom Kippur, we recite every day in our prayer psalms, chapter 130, which begins with, Shir HaMalot, from the depths I have called you, O God. Now, the question here is, why depths, plural? It should just say from the depth. And the answer is that there's two types of depths. In the heart, there's the outer heart and the inner heart. The outer heart is the depths, the inner heart is the depths of depths. What's the difference? The difference is that the outer heart, the depths, is influenced by the mind. Our feelings, our reactions, our paradigms are all affected by what the mind perceives. However, the depths of depths, the inner heart, the inner heart doesn't answer to the mind's perceptions and paradigms and understanding. Rather, it is an expression of our core being. So let's look at the difference. The heart that is affected by the mind, the mind understands that sins create retribution, and thus the mind perceives a fear of sins, and thus the repentance is one out of fear. That is the level of teshuva that we do all year round. And thus, it helps us to turn our intentional sins into unintentional mistakes, and thus we are forgiven. However, on Yom Kippur, when we call out from the depths, the plural, the depths of depths of our heart, which talks about the core being of our soul, which is truly a piece of God, this teshuva is the teshuva of love. Now we can understand what the Yom Kippur process is all about. It's about taking our most intentional sins, distasteful, and transforming them into actual gems, sparkling, brilliant mitzvot, which God adores. Now, let us turn to God's vow. What is the vow that God made that before Yom Kippur can transform our sins into brilliant, shining mitzvot, God has to do something. He has to annul a vow. Which vow? So now let us turn to God's vow. In Genesis, as we are told of God's creating the universe, on the sixth day, the verse states, and that's chapter 1, verse 31, and it was evening and it was morning the sixth day. 
Now, our sages note the additional prefix of the hey to the word sixth, meaning hashishi, the sixth. When in all the five previous days, the verse did not have the prefix hey to the number. It just read it was the evening and the morning of day one, of day two. It doesn't say the day one, the day two. Now, when the Torah has a prefix hey, what this means is that the reverse is referring to a distinctive, a specific renowned one. So which specific renowned day six is our verse alluding to? Our, our sages thus teach us in the Talmud Tractic Shabbat, page 88, side A, and I quote, Chizkiah said, Chizkiah was a very, very famous sage. What is the meaning of that which is written? You caused sentence if it was silent. Why would, I'm sorry, you caused sentence to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was silent. I'm sorry, that's the verse in Tehillim. You caused sentence to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was silent. Now, Chizkiah asks a question. If it was afraid, why was it silent? And if it was silent, right, you cause sentence to be heard from heaven refers to the revelation at Sinai. So thus what he's saying here is that it was afraid and it was silent. And it explains as follows, that first it was silent. And what it means it was silent was that we heard the sentence. What is the sentence we're talking about? We're talking about God giving the Torah, the revelation at Sinai. And why was the earth afraid after this silence? And it says, it is in accordance with the statement of Rosh Lakish. Once again, Rosh Lakish, the name of Shimon. Rosh Lakish said, what is the meaning of that which is written? And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Why do I inquire the superfluous letter, hey, the, 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 the definite article, which does not appear on any of the other days? It teaches that the Holy One, blessed be He, established a condition with the act of creation and said to them, if Israel accepts the Torah on the sixth day of the month of Sivin, there you have it, the distinct sixth day, on the sixth day of Sivin, when we were given the Ten Commandments, if we will accept it, you will exist. And if they do not accept it, I will return you to the primordial state of chaos and disorder. Therefore, the earth was afraid until the Torah was given to Israel, lest it be turned to a state of chaos. Once the Jewish people accepted the Torah, the earth was calm. Okay, so I, I, kind, of, I kind of tripped over my tongue. So let me just give it in two seconds. What we're saying here is that God, we learn out from the extra hay, the distinct article of the sixth day, that God made a condition with the entire creation that your existence depends on the sixth day of the month, the Hebrew calendar month of Sivan in the year 2448, when I will bring the Jewish people to Mount Sinai and give them the Torah. If they accept it, then you continue to exist. If they don't accept it, everything will be returned to its primordial state of chaos. Now, you see here, there was a condition a vow that if you will, if you will call it a vow, that God made with all of existence, that it would depend on the cause and effect of the Torah and the Jewish people's adherence thereof. Let us take this one level deeper. After the flood was over and Noah brought offerings to God, the verse states, and the Lord smelled the pleasant aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will no longer curse the earth because of man, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will no longer smite all living things as I have done. So long as the earth exists, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. And then God goes on to say, And I, behold, I am setting up my covenant okay so once again we're seeing here god made a covenant a vow with the universe that god will always keep the lights and the vessels balanced 
so that they would never experience the shattering of an imbalance. Thus, the verse in Psalm tells us, for a sun and a shield is the Lord. Over here, Lord means the Hebrew word is Havaya, the ineffable tetragrammaton. God, Elohim, is the name. Upon which our sages explain that the vessels Elohim will serve as a finite shield in order to contain a balanced revelation from the infinite light of Havaya. Even more so, even the infinite light of Havaya, the ineffable tetragrammaton, the light, is balanced through the four letters of the name of God. Yud, which is a dot, contraction. He, expansion. Vav, a line drawing downward. And another He, ex expansion here below. The point what I'm saying here is that we can now understand the vow, the condition, and the covenant that God must nullify as a prelude to the Yom Kippur transformation of sins into merits. And this nullification of God's vow is hinted in the verse of purification for Yom Kippur. In Leviticus, the Torah portion that talks about the day of Yom Kippur, and we read it on the Torah on Yom Kippur, there's a verse there, chapter 16, verse 30. And for on this day, he shall effect atonement for you to cleanse you before the Lord. Lifne Havaya. You shall be cleansed from all your sins. Now in Kabbalah and Hasidus, the words Lifne Havaya, before the ineffable tetragrammaton, before the infinite light, you shall be cleansed, means that to reach the possibility of being cleansed for our sins to be transformed into merits, we must reach above before, beyond, the infinite light of Avaya, which is connected and locked into the vow, condition, and covenant that God made. So there you go. In the covenant of orderliness, cause and effect, Torah, sins and mitzvot, vessels and light, balanced vessels and light, finite expansion and revelation of light, is all locked into this vow of orderliness, cause and effect. And in that level, you can turn sin into mitzvot. Sin is darkness, mitzvot is light. So in order to really accomplish what Yom Kippur needs to accomplish, there needs to be an annulment of this vow that God made to keep the orderliness and the boundaries. And thus, the verse tells us that if you to reach the atonement of Yom Kippur, we need to go lifne havaya, above the infinite light, into the essence. Now, the question is then, how do we arouse God to annul his vow of havaya and Elohim balance by us connecting with God on the most intimate level of essence, which is before havaya? above his light, into his essence. To understand this, we must understand the reason why it is that only while we are physically alive can we do teshuvah, repentance. While after the soul leaves the physical realm, a person passes away, she, the soul, cannot do teshuvah, but must go through the painful forms of purification through the process of purgatory and the likes, in order to be cleansed from sin? The answer is that the spiritual realms of divine light and vessels is called, Hebrew word, seder hishtal shalut, order of evolution. It is here with a process of cause and effect and that of what Kabbalah calls ila the alul, the cause and the caused such as intellect and emotions, intellect, understanding things, causes emotional reactions. So the, only in the seder hishtal shalut, in the order of evolution of, the, of the, the light and the vessels, there dominates, sealed with the vow of God. This order of evolution functions through contractions and concealments of the spiritual infinite light through the vessels and partitions and the likes. However, regardless of how many times we are going to conceal and contract spiritual divine light, we will never produce 
from a spiritual divine light, a physical mass. Thus, Kabbalah wants to know where did the physical come from? Thus, we are taught all of the spiritual realms are all the work of the infinite light of God, spirituality, which is locked into the order of evolution, the cause and the cause, and the cause and effect vow. The physical realm, however, is the work of above Havaya, above and beyond the infinite light, in which the essence, above and beyond any vow, condition, and covenant, governs. Now we understand which vow we must annul as a prelude to Yom Kippur, and how in turn this solicits of God to annul his vow, lifting us above Havaya into the bosom of his essence. So which is our vow that we need to annul, which solicits in return that God annul his vow of boundaries between darkness and light? bringing us above the infinite light, allowing us to transform our darkness of sin into the brilliance of mitzvot. So, we too have made a vow and a covenant in the outer heart, which is locked into our paradigm of the logical right and wrong, and the logical balance of the spiritual and the secular. In our vow, we separate our physicality from our spirituality, our office from our synagogue, our work life from our Jewish life, and our pursuit of happiness from our faith. And in this vow, we committed to be practical and balanced in our Torah commitment, not going beyond our comfort zone of Torah study, prayer, and charity. Annulling our vow, is our finding God, our Jewishness, and our commitment specifically in our secular lives, in our physical pursuit of happiness, and in our efforts in making money. Once we annul our vow of separation between our heaven and earth, spiritual, physical, physical pursuits, secular pursuits, and spiritual faith and Jewishness, finding our deepest essence connection with God in our physical actions, then this arouses God, in turn, to perform the same, raising us above the Havaya separation between darkness and light into his essence, unconditional bond and love, in which our past sins and blockage can be transformed into mitzvot and blessings. How so? When sin becomes mitzvot, let's understand this. Our sages explain that the word mitzvah, commandment, good deed, comes from the word tzafsa, which means chibur, connection and bonding into one. And the word avera, sin, comes from the word over ritzono, crossing, turning away from his will. Thus, the soul of a mitzvah is that it connects us face to face in becoming connected to God. And the soul of an avera, a sin, is that we have turned ourselves away from his will, his face, and are now in a back-to-back -back disconnected relationship with God. However, when sin becomes the very impetus of our remorse, repentance, a potent drive, and a yearning to return and connect face to face with God, then ultimately what's happening here? The sin became a mitzvah, as it now caused us to ultimately bond and connect with God. In the order of evolution, the light, darkness, Sin can never become light, for they are infinitely distanced and separated from one another. However, in the physical abode of God's essence, in which everything, even darkness, is God, and God is everything, we can transform darkness into light and an intentional sin into a mitzvah. How? By simply utilizing the sin to do what a mitzvah does, to connect us to God, driving us to teshuva, repentance, return. So, 
let's get physical. Our sages explain why it is that on Yom Kippur, at the potent time of Mincha services, we read about all the prohibited illicit sexual re relations. Now, the reason given is that on Yom Kippur, the evil inclination pushes us into spirituality, not wanting us to remember and to face our physical shameful sins. However, as we explained, the spirituality of Yom Kippur is precisely all about our shameful physical acts in using them and transforming them into actions that now have us intimately facing God like a child to a parent asking for forgiveness, for guidance, and for connection. Hence, our sages instituted that we read and face our ego and shame and to read about any and every physical sin that we may have done, as shameful as they may be, so that we can repent for every one of them transforming them into brilliant, shining mitzvot connections with God. So in closing, Rabbi Leitzog of Bardichev once approached the shtetl Ganef, that means the village thief, and said to him, I envy you, ich bin de mekane. The thief sadly and shamefully responded, Rebbe, why do you mock me? To which Rabbi Leitzog responded, chas shalom." Heaven for Fen, I deeply and truly mean what I say. Don't you see, Yasso? That was the Ganav's name. If you do Teshuvah, your sins will become shining and brilliant mitzvot in God's eyes, far greater and more brilliant than any of my mitzvot. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, is the power of Yom Kippur. If we can only annul our partition, keeping our sins and physical pursuits away from God. Let us bring our sins to God and let our sins bring us to God. And therein lies our intimacy with God. May you have an easy fast, a meaningful fast, and an incredible moment of self-reflection under the beautiful shine of God's unconditional love, doing teshuva returning to God, not just with my soul and my spirituality, but returning to God with my defects, with my past mistakes, with my physical body and shortcomings. Gemar Chatima Tovah.